everyone. So today we'll be talking about background removal. Hope you're excited about it. Please prepare, there'll be a lot of pictures, so clean your eyes, Whew, let's go. So a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Ariadna Kramkowska, as already mentioned. I have a degree in computer science from the University of Latvia, and I currently work as a data scientist in the Generative ML squad. Uh, and the things that I'm interested in researching and working on would be LLMs, of course, uh, computer vision, NLP stuff, and outside of work, uh, when I'm not researching those wonderful things, I also like fiber arts, such as crochet and sewing. I like hiking, but please do not be fooled. That is not in Latvia. We live in a very flat country. And I also like cats. I have two of my own that visit my meetings very frequently. Colleagues love them. I'm sure about it. And uh, today I'm representing Printify, which is a print-on-demand company that allows people to become entrepreneurs by creating and selling custom products. And maybe someone here already heard about print-on-demand just to understand the level of the audience. Cool. So some people, but not a lot. So let's give a practical example just to make it more clear of how you can actually use uh, our platform. So. Christmas is coming up. Let's say you have a colleague, Tom, that you're very friendly with, and you know that Tom loves Python. He just really loves Python. So what better way to show it than with a custom T-shirt? So you go to Printify, you put the lovely Python image uh, on the T-shirt, then you create the product, then you place it as a sample, or you just create an order with it, and boom, happy Tom, happy Python T-shirt. Maybe not exactly this one because, you know, like background removed and stuff, like who would wear that? Uh, I can explain, I can explain. So this might be an extreme example, but uh, background removal works in mysterious ways. For example, when you're just getting started, you can just not know that you cannot place a white background uh, or with a, like a, an image with a white background on a white t-shirt because it will be printed quite weirdly and it's not going to be something you'd expect. You might uh, have run into issues with your customers or Tom if he's very particular about his t-shirts or you, as a beginner designer, you're also not going to know that semi-transparency can cause some issues. So you might create a very complex design, you'll be very happy about it, but then when you get it sent, it's actually not looking as crisp as when you saw it on the mockups. So you have to take a lot of the things into account. Uh, so that's why the background removal is very important in our platform. And uh, when we realized that this is a problem, that merchants are actually uh, uh, complaining about it, they don't want to, like, for example, if you, you get offered an image that has a background, you're not really wanting to include it because you want people to buy your product, obviously. So as a business, the first thing we did, we thought, okay, background removal sounds quite familiar, so there are probably tools online that have already got it handled, and they're super proper experts on it, right? So one of the companies that we partner up with, uh, they do some image enhancement stuff for us. Uh, we talked to them, and they actually had a background removal uh, tool uh, in the works, and they offered us a free demo to understand how it works, and we were like, super, let's see it. And we thought it's going to be like super great, and we were going to be using it and whatnot. But then you look at it, and well, not really there, you know? Uh, there are common issues such as parts of the text can be missing, uh, maybe something gets removed where it shouldn't have been, or it's the other way around, you know? And uh, in this particular scenario, the reasons for this are quite obvious. So uh, they were targeting it uh, towards e-commerce, which is an entirely different sphere. Like if you want to show something like a product, like a book, uh, a photo camera, something else, and you wanted to uh, to do a customized background for it, okay, yeah, that will work. But uh, the designs of the t-shirts, the mugs, any other products that we could sell, they are quite particular in a way, and they are not similar to the product images. And as, as measured by the company themselves, the success rate for this scenario was only 10%. We sent them a bunch of images that, we could be, that it could be evaluated on, and it was only 10%, which is obviously not something we would want to use. Uh, and that's where we thought, like, fine-tuning could be of help, yes. But if you think about it, 
uh, they're not really targeting print-on-demand companies, which we are only one. And if every other company in the market with their own specific domain and sphere and data will come to them, it's not going to be much profitable for them. Uh, so it's not like they were trying to put us as a priority and fine tune specifically for us. Uh, so, all right, that happens. Let's go to the other uh, solutions. Uh, we, we know that there are some other external tools. And how do we compare them? Well, we definitely want to know what the inference speed would be like, uh, what's the pricing of those tools, and uh, the results should be measured on different types of images that we have in our system. So one of them would be the graphic image. So something like, you know, a human, a forest, some kind of object, no text. Then the text alone, so it will be only textual information. And there is a combo of both, which is quite popular if you go on Etsy, for example, and search for some, I don't know, Python t-shirts, you're most likely gonna stumble upon a logo, then I love Python, let's say. So uh, we measured it on, a, we, we did some comparison on other tools, and this is just one of the samples. And you can see that it's definitely better than we first saw, but it's still not perfect. Uh, you can see by the arrows that some elements are still missing. Uh, it's not critical. You can, in, in, most, in some cases, you can just bring the text back, but not in all cases, and this is a very, very s small sample. So here we thought that since we have an ML team, that we can experiment, that we can do some research, and create a model that is better than the external solutions, and look at how the results of the training our own model will look like. So this kind of task falls under computer vision umbrella, and it's called salient object detection. And uh, basically what it is, it's very human-oriented in the definition, such as you would want to detect what the human eye catches first. So that would be the background. So let's say you have a person. It's, it's going to be the first thing that catches your eye, and forest will be the background. And with all of the other pictures, it's like that as well. So the ground truth for this task would be an image, uh, the original one, and then the black and white mask, where black is the background, white is the foreground. So. Let's go to train our model. But we have no data. Uh, tail is all this time. Well, not really. If you think about it, it's not impossible to create the data for these tasks. So that's what we did. Uh, this is the very first model prototype that we had. It was a very quick one. Uh, but basically, what we did is we generated some training data. We took some t-shirt designs and then manually created the masks for those images. And in the end, it was not a big set. It was just 25 images, uh, like 25 image pairs. And uh, what I did is actually, it was trained in the local PC. So very, very small, quick test, if it's even, if it's even holding up to the concept of training a model. And the model that we used was the U2Net, a neural network uh, with an encoder-decoder structure. And uh, let's look at the results. Obviously, still not great. Kind of looking more than the, like the first result than the external one that was commercially available. So I, I understand why it's better. But still, if you think about it, this was self-trained on just 25 images. And it was trained for 100 epochs and on a local PC. So that's a very, very small set. But you can still see that the potential is there. Like, uh, it's not the completely noise. Uh, there are images where it's almost like 80% good with the Panther one, let's say. Uh, and then the other ones, we can do better with more training. It's, it has potential. So the next thing we did was create a data generator script. Uh, and basically, we took the images that we have, uh, and uh, you know that there could be different approaches to creating the data. Uh, but here, we decided not to kind of, you, you know, when you have an image with a background, then you remove the background, so that becomes the training data set. We actually did the other way around. So if we have the PNGs with no background, we can add a background to that and use that as a training set, and then uh, programmatically create uh, the masks of the images that we have transparent. So that is exactly what we did. There is some code, uh, but basically it was it was a small script, it was not a big effort, so it's definitely not perfect, but still, it works. 
We also took a look at the alpha channels of the image, since we have that information encoded, uh, to understand that, you know, that PNGs does, BNG format doesn't mean that the image will be transparent. So we also had to take, take a look for that, do other checks, create uh, the random backgrounds either by a random color, or we also uh, gathered a smart set of uh, backgrounds that we could use in a ratio of the training set, put the, those patterns, just so it's not overfitting to just extract the solid color in the background. So here is the next model. It's very similar to the last one, but the difference here is that we have more data. It is acquired programmatically. The model we use is still the same. So this is, this is how it would look like, just to give you an insight. Uh, so you see that, OK, here is the original image. Like The, the brain would be uh, the original one. Then the blue would be a random color that we posted. And then this is the mask that we created. So we feed it to the model and see how it looks like. All right. This is not perfect still, but when you look at it, it's getting better and better. In some cases, it's even usable. Like the, the last two, I'd say I could use. This is great. So moving forward. Uh, the next thing that we did was we actually thought about the YouTube net and how it's built. So there is an open source model that is actually pre-trained for tens of thousands of epochs on a, on a large and very research data set. So it, would, it seemed very logical that we utilize the knowledge that the model can have because we will not be able to train uh, for that large of a data set for that amount of epochs and have it be uh, computationally and uh, financially uh, great. So that is actually what, what we did. Uh, we used the UTNet that, UTNet that was pre-trained pre on the uh, DUTS salient object detection data set, which has roughly 11,000 training images and 5,000 test images. And then we find you with the same set that we used for just the pure training in the last model. And uh, if you're interested in the training environment, we used, it, we used an Amazon SageMaker notebook uh, with accelerated computing instance. Uh, yeah, so let's look at the results. Now, this is something I really like to see. You know that these images already seem something like we can actually put in a product and have it be really sellable. It, it's looking nice. OK, maybe there is a little bit here and there where it could, where it could be improved, but still, you know, 100 epochs. Not 70,000, very big difference. Uh, and you also might say that uh, this, is, this is looking very cherry-picked. You're probably just advertising your company. Well, I'm not advertising my company, but this is kind of cherry-picked. We also had mistakes where it, doesn't, where it didn't look so good. Uh, and we looked at those uh, images where something was not quite working right. Uh, and one interesting fact that uh, there is also only one example here with the pug. Uh, but we actually noticed also that the lower region of the image was the one that's causing the most troubles. But it also happened in other places, like there is a missing hand here, something is not quite right there, and also the background is still in the letters themselves, which is not great. So our theory was that uh, we can improve this just by creating a cleaner data set. And uh, since the results were leaving to be desired, uh, we took a look at the data set. And in the end, it really turned out to be the issue of the data. Uh, one issue was that if you look at the examples, you can kind of tell that there is a blue lettering here beyond the rooster. But with the background that it was selected randomly, it's not really working. There had to be, like, I as a human, I'm confused by looking at this, so we can only imagine what the model is thinking. Uh, same scenario here. Uh, sometimes it even blends in completely. So when, when there is black on black, which is what's created randomly, how can a model even learn anything when the mask is one thing and then the original is one thing where you can't really tell anything? So uh, we cleaned the data set. Uh, we, uh, we cleaned up those uh, with, the back, with the bad backgrounds. Sometimes it was also an issue of uh, not really greatly working uh, backgrounds where they were uh, too large of a pattern and they were taking over the design. You could not really tell where is the background, where is the foreground. So we took out those, took out those where the colors were blending. 
And we also took out some uh, images that were not really high quality, uh, since we really didn't filter out those that perhaps are low resolution or something. So yeah, let's see if that really helped. So those are the same images. And now, you, as you can see, it's uh, looking much better. Uh, you can see that the hand is there. You can see that the text is no longer blurry. And the lower region of the image is actually looking, looking nicer. This is something that we can move forward with, because otherwise it's, it, it seemed like a trouble. So we proceeded to use this model with our further experiments. And one more interesting thing that we needed to, uh, to research was the post-processing of the image. Uh, so there is this thing called eye smoothing. Uh, maybe I should have put an example of how it's looking. But you can tell here that uh, like the text is not super greatly uh, visible, and the edges are not very smooth. But if you apply alpha matting, uh, you can actually refine the edges, uh, remove, the very, remove some noise that, sh that shouldn't be there, and uh, make things just nicer looking. So this is one of the attempts. Uh, this is with the erosion size one. And uh, you can see that the text now is fully white, not with a black border. Uh, the edges are looking quite nice. And this is definitely something we can use. Uh, but you also have to be careful with this, because too much post-processing would mean that uh, you can remove the details that you're not actually wanting to remove. Like, if you have some very fine text on the design, it might get removed in this process. And also, you have to take into account that alpha matting is a computationally expensive uh, procedure. And the more you do it, the more timely it gets, which we do not want. We want a fast response for the users. Here is another example also. Uh, you can see that I do not advocate to you for you to do it, but in some cases where, let's say, the foreground was removed a little bit too much, with alpha matting, it's actually kind of fixing the mistakes of uh, bring, uh, bringing out the foreground. But still, this is not the proper way to do it. It's just a nice bonus. Uh, with bigger training sets and a bigger training time, you just have less of a mistake in the original image that will be later post-processed. So the next step that we did was actually compare the in-house model with the external one. And uh, I have to say already that the judging was, uh, the judging was very subjective. It was very hands-on, so uh, submitting the images to the external tools, and then looking at them and seeing which, which one was better just to my eye. And, and it was very, very non-straightforward and sometimes. Uh, sometimes it was very close, so it's really hard to give it to some of the things. Um, and uh, also one note is that it was compared against uh, free external uh, tools results. So if we say that external wins, it means that actually at least one of the models got a better result, which is not really fair. Uh, because it could be one model is better in one type of image, then the other one is better at the other type of image. It could be very spread apart. Uh, but still, it was very surprising to us that we managed to match the performance of the models that have been commercially available. They are trained. They are made to be sold. Uh, and we have a tie in 56% of the cases. I think that's a very good ratio for us, especially when the training was not uh, that comprehensive, it was just a prototype still. OK, it was trained more, it was more iterative, but not exactly something to be yet product productionized. And if you look at some of the examples, uh, let's say that uh, it's a good one because it has uh, representations of different types of images. So let's say on text, all of them look quite fine. The in-house ones look fine. External, fine uh, external ones look usable, so that's great. Uh, then there are some where, it's, uh, where the models have different opinions about what they're seeing. So uh, on the top one, uh, one of the models sees that only the person should be the foreground. This one is not very great looking, to be honest. And ours thinks that the circle in the middle should be the foreground. And as a human, I'm not really sure what I would do, so it's not that I see it as a big, big minus. And uh, if you see the I'm image plus text type of image, ours are actually performing better. One of the models 
because otherwise, uh, other ones uh, got either the text fully removed or partially removed, which is even worse, to be honest. So yeah, those are good results. And uh, what is happening now with this project? It's, uh, I'd say, a, su a successful pro proof of concept. Uh, and now the assessment is being made whether we can uh, uh, create something on our own, pr put it properly in production. So what we need to do is to understand how it, what, what it costs to host the service, uh, what would be the maintenance effort. Uh, and then we would also need to do like a proper modeling and periodic retraining effort, um, understand how reliable it is, all of that stuff. So and before we understand, the, the, before we move to production, we still need to understand, like, is it viable? How, lo how long it would take us? How much money would we need to invest? The boring stuff. So what are the takeaways from this? Is that external tools are a great first thing to look at. Maybe they will actually be something that you're really comfortable with, so we can use them. Why, why, why invest time if the, uh, if the gain over that is not too big? Uh, then fine-tuning open source models with domain-specific data can give good results, as you've already seen. Um, then one thing that was interesting is that even if you're using something that you're fi finding online, uh, you, can, you should analyze what you're using because you might find some offenders. For example, one of the cases that we did like that is that we didn't like the time that we were saying that it took to train the model because one epoch was train uh, taking a very long time, like three minutes, four minutes, something like that. And if you understand that you have a bunch of images and you want to train for longer, you're going to need to decrease the time. So what we actually did, we analyzed the training code, and we realized that uh, the model was taking in 320 x 320 type uh, wide images, and it was doing it on the fly. So it was for every image, when it saw in batches, it was still removing again, the, uh, it was still rescaling again, which took a very long time. So what we did, we created another script that actually rescaled the images before we uh, started the training, and that was immediately much, much faster. It, was, it, was, it, it went down to 15, 20 seconds per epoch. And uh, with this, there's still room to grow. Uh, you can get more data, you can tune the hyperparameters, which we didn't did because it was a thing that we'd, we wanted to do quite fast, to ch just to check the theory that it actually works. And, uh, of course, longer training, because Still, as I said, 100 epochs is nothing compared to tens of thousands of epochs that these models are typically trained on. So, thank you. Uh, actually, if you are interested, we, have, we are hiring. We have some data and ML model positions. So if you really want to see the code, maybe you're interested in that, you can just join us and you'll gain access immediately. So, yep, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, yeah, really uh, nice to follow along. Uh, I especially like the process of, uh, hey, we need more data, let's just make our own data, which is not of, oh, yeah, always the obvious uh, solution, uh, I think. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Probably a few, yeah, right here in the front. Uh, hi, so my question is, have you thought about using the smoothed out images as a training data? Because you said they improve upon the result of the model, so they can be given to the model as a better example of what it did. I don't think that's a typically used approach in, uh, in this type of task, because, uh, yeah, the mask isn't isn't as uh, smooth as, it expe as, uh, as you would expect just to be used uh, as a print file, which is very, very uh, delicate work, I'd say. Uh, it's just like a, a black and white map. So I'd say that it's something that should be done uh, still after the fact of the removal, but still, it's, that's an interesting thought. Maybe I will read into this. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, I think my question is partially answered if you also would use uh, the fusion models, because I see uh, uh, an engineering manager for a generative AI, a generative ML team. But would you consider indeed using, uh, for instance, uh, stable diffusion models to either generate data or generate masks? Have you looked into that? Uh, I have not. I think that uh, we are also using some AI images uh, 
on the website, we have an AI image generator that merchants can use and actually create their own designs with AI. So I think that will be potentially helpful. I think a combo of two approaches, so historical data, maybe stable diffusion data, would be actually nice to kind of balance it out. So, yeah. yeah. All the way in the back. Uh, hi, um, I have a question. How do you deal with transparent objects? Have you tried to do it? Transparent? Uh, like glass, plastic bottle. I don't think I have dealt with this just because I haven't stumbled upon some of it. Perhaps someone would use an image of a plastic bottle, but I don't think it's a common case in our scenario. Uh, do you, you, you meant like the plastic or the glass object as a design, right? Yes. Well, I think it's similar to a problem that we had, uh, let's say, where was it? Let me prove my point. Uh, it would be something like, like this. So uh, the difference between the, the background and the foreground, which is the white background, very light beige uh, text, is very difficult for most of the models. So you can kind of extend your data set with more objects like these, but it's still not 100% guaranteed that it will work well, especially if the difference between the background and the contents are, is very small. It's just the way it is, unfortunately. Yeah, I'm asking, you know, like taking glass uh, on the white background and putting on the black t-shirt or something. So it doesn't sound easy, right? It's, it's not. <laughs> Thanks. Any further questions? Going once, going twice. All right. In that case, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. We do have a small gift on behalf of the organizing committee. Um, so as not to let you leave Eindhoven empty-handed, the Thank you. very exclusive PyData Eindhoven Mac. Uh, please give it up for Ariadne.